Hey there. I wanted to go over some of the tactics I've seen large organizations uh, go through when they're looking to improve the way that they do their own software, their custom written software, as I would call it. I think a lot about uh, what that act is, looking at the, the software that you have and trying to improve your ability, not only to produce it and have it be higher quality, but also have it be more useful to your business to actually uh, make your business more agile and flexible to lead your business uh, largely based on your capability to create better software. To me, that's what digital transformation is. I mean, it's kind of a ridiculous phrase, but it's the one, the one that we uh, are beset with or uh, set up with to use. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot to learn from observing how uh, large organizations have succeeded and failed for that. So let's jump into it. So first of all, uh, I want to go over what Pivotal does. You know, oftentimes, uh, a couple months ago, this, this came up uh, again, more than a couple months now, but I was talking with a large organization and I had been enjoying myself going on and on for about 20 minutes and someone finally stopped me and said they had no idea what Pivotal did, which was uh, unfortunate given that that's where I work. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of what Pivotal does and we'll get to the meat of, of things. So there's two parts of what Pivotal does with our customers. The first thing is we have a software product called Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Now, as we'll come back to, this is a platform, a platform as a service that is the runtime environment, defines how uh, middleware and services are added, and gives uh, developers a completely self-service way of running and deploying their applications and even uh, managing them in production. It has tremendous efficiencies it brings to doing that and uh, layers on top of whatever type of cloud, private or public, you have. Uh, and is really there to remove a lot of the toil and, and annoyance of managing uh, a cloud, if you will. So on top of that, we have a, a bunch of tools like the Spring Framework. Perhaps, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the most, but one of the most widely used ways of doing Java software development. So it's used across the world and all sorts of organizations. But and there's, there's also uh, tools for doing .NET development and I think five or six other programming languages. Now we also have a couple of other tools, uh, you know, some some little middleware things here and some data tools as well. But we also have tools for uh, doing basic um, release, I guess you could call it project management, for ma managing the features that you have in each release called Pivotal Tracker. And it's a Kanban-oriented way of managing stories, moving them around, managing your backlog. And then we have a uh, build pipeline orchestration tool called Concourse. Uh, that many organizations uh, use as well. Now, on top of that, technology is great. It's very, very helpful. It's necessary for changing, but not sufficient. And the other part that becomes uh, necessary uh, to change the way your organization does software and improve it is to change over the process, or more, more usually it's called the culture. So you want, as we'll get into, you're going to be changing your organization over to a product-centric, innovation-led uh, culture, following a lot of agile best practices, agile software design best practices, and lean design. And getting to that point is quite difficult for most organizations. So we have uh, this part, this consultative part of the company called Pivotal Labs that comes in and pairs up with your developers and your team and teaches them by doing, um, and eventually trains them up enough to be self-sufficient and learn the new ways of doing agile software development. Now, on top of that, we have a uh, ever-growing and improving body of work about how you lead this change and how you change the overall organization structure, what leadership does, what enterprise architects do, so that you're really changing the culture and leading uh, the transformation of your organization from a services-driven way of doing things to a product way. So that's a brief overview of what Pivotal does. Now we work with all sorts of organizations of uh, many, many types, right? From uh, Sonic down there to, uh, we'll give you tasty hamburgers and delicious, you know, uh, buried in cheddar cheese uh, tater tots, maybe some chili on there if you're really adventurous. And then of course we have uh, many banks that we work with uh, from Citi, HSBC, DBS, uh, people like FedEx, large government organizations like the U.S. Air Force and, and other uh, civilian agencies, as they would say, manufacturers from cars like Daimler, Ford, Boeing, other types of manufacturers, uh, insurance companies, as you can see up there, all sorts of organizations. And all of them share this same need to, they really want to start using, as, I, as I've been saying, they want to use software to improve the way they do uh, their business and make their business programmable, if you will. And therefore, they're looking to change how they've been doing software to the most modern product-centric way of doing it. Like we would do at a software company, essentially, where our primary business, our core asset is software. And that's what all of these organizations share, is they want to move 
their software production and the software that's being used as their, uh, their sort of their primary, maybe not the primary, but one of the top three ways of running their business. So with that, let's look at the, the shift. How do we currently think about IT mostly and what are we trying to change to? So what we're trying to change to is nicely illustrated by one of our customers at uh, Air France KLM. It's this small batch process that you go through. But I think what's good to start with is the current way we have of thinking about software. Now, in the agile software world, the big bugbear, the evil baddie of software process is always, uh, we call it waterfall. A whole lot of upfront planning that lasts anywhere from like several months to six months to maybe even years if you're in uh, the military or government. And you specify every single thing that the software needs to do, the requirements it must satisfy. Developers work on it, and then they deploy it eventually after it being tested. And this cycle usually takes uh, a year or more. Sometimes people get it down to like six months or something. But the thing that is really characteristic about it is specifying a whole lot of things up front, what the software should do, predicting the problems you're solving, how you'll solve them, and then also passing this along to various stages. And you can imagine the waterfall is sort of going down. That's where this name comes from. And you're passing it to these different parts of the organization that do their part and then pass it along. Now, in the broader IT world, this was codified in a, a body of work back when I was a young programmer. Uh, I would always think of it as ITSM, IT service management, where IT is information technology, if you want the full thing. Um, and this was often codified in like ITEL and other kind of ways of thinking about it. And whether it's custom written software or anything else, it follows the same cycle of taking in a request for a service to deliver, a project to do, specifying out how it's going to do and agreeing to how it's going to be run and measured, how people will be rated and compensated for it and punished, you know, your SLAs and all that, and then delivering it. And then, and then running it, and then somehow starting that process over again. Now, in the best of all possible worlds, as that continuous process improvement says on the ITSM wheel there, you're continually improving how you, you do it. But what I found is over the years, and maybe we'll see this with the small batch process over the next 20 years or so as well, but people sort of optimize on not changing and doing the same thing over and over again. And they get stuck in this kind of infinite wheel of just delivering a project and not actually putting in the work to improve it or their, their, uh, their process. And they're just delivering that project over and over again. And there's a lot of tickets involved and help desks and you have to fill them out. And you start to lose focus on the product. And that's what the small batch process forces you to, to uh, focus on. Uh, and that is... When you're delivering uh, software and you want it to be a product, you want to make it as, as uh, fit to what users want to do as possible, make them as productive, make it uh, as useful to solve their problems as quickly and not have a lot of waste in the system of just like waiting for reviews and filling out tickets and planning things out that could be automated. So you target deploying your software on a weekly basis. And what you want to do is you come up with a theory of what a user's problem is and how to solve that problem. And I'll get to an example here quickly. Um, but the way you test that is you write code and you put it in front of actual users, again, on a weekly basis. And then you observe how people are using it and you see if it kind of passes your test, right? What your theory was of how it was going to solve their problem. And if it does, then great. You go on to solve another problem. And if it doesn't, then while you can think that you failed at it, you've actually learned a way that it doesn't work and you come up with a new theory and you run through that cycle again. So week to week, you imagine putting uh, these, these releases out, testing theories, failing, that is learning, and improving your software every week. You put a small bit of code out, learn, put a small bit of code out, get better, on and on. And taking advantage of that really fast feedback loop, as our friends at Air, Force, Air, Air France KLM uh, were going over, this is what the organizations we work with, what they're trying to achieve as far as a process when they're becoming a product organization. Now, I'll give you a quick example. This is an example from, uh, you know, us, my, my uh, and my fellow Americans' favorite government agency, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, or as my grandfather used to call it, the Infernal Revenue Service. I'm, I'm not quite sure what he meant there. Anyhow, uh, you pay your taxes every year, your federal taxes to the entire government. And uh, if you don't pay your taxes on time, maybe you are busy with your kids or maybe you're like holed up in a compound somewhere and you're protesting something like you hate highways or something like that. Anyways, uh, you don't pay your taxes on time and the IRS has like the worst notification system ever. What they do is every single day they penalize you more and you owe more money. So you're very incented if you're not in a compound there to uh, call up the IRS uh, as, as you need to do and uh, basically find out how much you owe that day and pay it off that day so that you don't owe more the next day. 
So the way the IRS approached this problem uh, is they had call centers. So people on phones and you would call them up and I imagine you call them and you're on hold and then they're talking about how their computer's slow that day and they're typing into something with the green screen and all these figures and maybe they're even sort of like meatware ETLing and integrating together information and then they tell you how much you owe and hopefully you can pay it off then. So this is a very costly thing to do. Humans are expensive. Call centers are error prone. They're also expensive. And the customer satisfaction of it is very low, right? Like no one likes to call the IRS. I don't even, I don't like to call anyone, right? Like let alone like the tax collector. So they had the idea uh, that they should use some software to improve this. Now, one of the things that hopefully the software was going to address because the costs were so high, also to put it in IT terms, uh, they only had 37% availability, which is to say that 63% of the time they would just hang up on you or you would never connect with anyone. Now that's, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty terrible SLA right there, right? 37% of the time it would work, 63% of the time it would. So this is like the worst case scenario of a, a service, if you will, a business that needs to improve. So when they were putting the software in place, they were able to avoid a major systemic failure that probably would have scuttled the whole project and been not cool for uh, everyone, including me, although I think I've always paid my taxes on time. Uh, but if they were delivering on a yearly or multi-year cycle, which is more likely with, with a government agency, they wouldn't have caught a key design flaw and uh, things just wouldn't have worked out. So because they were doing a small batch process, they came up with a theory of how to solve this problem. So you want to know how much money you owe the IRS. So I've highlighted in orange the part you're supposed to see. But when you logged in, you would see your complete financial history with the IRS. You could just relive your relationship, kind of like when you log into Facebook or other things, and it says, here's what happened five years ago. So it's fun. You know, I mean, just like an engineer or an accountant, like you have all this information, you want to look through the logs or the financial transactions. It's fun to kind of luxuriate in all of that data. So they displayed all this data and they tested it out with users, again, getting feedback about the theory of how to solve the problem. Uh, and they found out that people were still confused and they wanted to pick up the phone and call. Maybe not all of them, but a huge amount of them, right? So they were, this is a failure in their design, right? And again, if they were on a year long cycle, let's be charitable, it would have been a complete failure of ROI. Things wouldn't have worked out well. People would still be calling. They might even have to eventually, you know, to make a big deal out of it, go in front of Congress and answer to why they'd wasted all this money and not solve the problem, right? But because they were actually following a small batch process and they were able to test out this theory, they very quickly found that this was not solving the problem. This is not a good way to solve it. So it sounds really ridiculous when you say it, but when you want to know how much money you owe the IRS, they found, you only want to know how much money you owe the IRS. So they came up with this better screen that shows them exactly how much their back taxes were and allowed them to pay it off. And now it's almost, I, I would up this because this 440 million is from, um, I think a year ago, but probably they're up to like half a billion dollars that they've cleared through this system, right? They definitely have a much better SLA than 63% of the time. And they've been able to do releases much more rapidly than, than the two-year cycles because they've switched over to being a product-driven organization. Now, that's sort of the end goal that everyone has as far as uh, when they're doing digital transformation for their software. And you can tell that my dog, she's very excited about improving software, if you can hear in the background. So... Let's spend the rest of the time talking about how you get to that point where you can have like the success of the IRS and avoid the kind of failure that would have come about if they were following a traditional service driven way of doing things. So it starts with organizing uh, yourself correctly, putting, setting up the way your organization is going to function to uh, encourage and make a product driven way of doing things uh, much better. So this is the traditional way that if you have a waterfall services driven uh, organization, you tend to find yourself organized. It's a funny way of thinking about find yourself, like you probably came into the organization and didn't decide to put it this way. But this is the way things are usually set up, which I would call a functional organization. The DevOps, like uh, thought lords and ladies, would call it a, um, a siloed organization. But the idea is that if we kind of go back to this, each of these, these columns are different functions that report up in their different report hierarchies. They have their own career ladders. They've got their own part that they contribute to each uh, development cycle. So you'll have your enterprise architects overseeing them, the developers, the QA people, the networking people who never want to seem to open a port for you like in less than a month or something. You've got your DBAs, all of these people who focus on their little part of the overall project, the service you're delivering on, if you remember that big wheel. Now, maybe at some point this was an efficient use of resources and it was cheaper and more dependable. But nowadays, with, excuse me, 
with better automation and ways of doing things, it actually is a hindrance to delivering on a weekly cycle, right? Just scheduling a meeting between all these people is going to probably take you a week and then someone's going to cancel and then the security person doesn't want to meet. And then you also lose fidelity of passing uh, your, your build back between these, your release, right? Like you have to re-explain, re-verify, always be convincing people that you've done the right job. And it's just a very inefficient way of doing things. And it's not going to work if you want to be a product-driven organization. So... If you'll pardon me getting a little drink here, I had a very thick sandwich, lots of whole wheat bread for whatever reason. This is the way that organizations are more shifting themselves to look like. So you still have the business with their attache cases and they could be governments or factories. You know, they're interested in making money likely. And right below that, you have, let's call them IT leadership from the CIO, the VP of applications and operations, enterprise architects, the people who are, if you will, programming and designing the organization and running it and helping transform it to what it should be. Now in the middle, you have the core of what we think about when it comes to software development and, and product delivery. And those are the product teams. And I'll go over these very briefly. But these are teams that actually work on the software, figure out what to do, develop it, and they, they work on it uh, continuously. Now the way you, you, instead of them being siloed, you make each of these product teams focused on an actual type of application they have. Here I've used banking to kind of illustrate what it is, right? So you might have your bill pay team, the mobile team, you know, transfers, whatever kind of, the way you determine this, EAs can help out a lot with this. But you determine one discrete uh, application, usually from an end user's point of view that they're fully dedicated to and work on. Now supporting all of that, enabling it, if you will, uh, is a, a platform probably a pivotal cloud platform if you want to be successful and use the best one that all the great organizations use. But you have a platform engineering team that is standing up, running, and extending that platform and working with the product teams as their customers when they're doing what you might think of as platform as a product. Now, you might also know this as site reliability engineers or SRE from, from Google Think, but we like to use all our own phrases for things at Pivotal, so we call them platform engineers. So let's look at the product teams and what they're composed of and what they do and, and how they work. So a product team, again, is focused on one type of one application, right? Let's just say, you know, with the IRS one, there's a good example of it's the application of um, paying your back taxes, right? You could have another one that does transfer services and it could even be back in things like single sign on or things like that. But they're focused on one application that maps to a team. Now, the team size can be anywhere from four to 12 people or so. And what are the people on those teams doing? Well, one of our customers, uh, Dick Sporting Goods, a retailer who sells sporting goods, uh, has a great chart that illustrates it. So one, you still need to write software and we haven't figured out how to automate that. So you have uh, engineers, as we like to call, as engineers like to call themselves, or developers, and they, you know, write the code. And they also, con they also uh, contribute to evaluating the technical feasibility of things and give input on the technical side. Now, you also have designers, uh, which is kind of the rarest role to find in existing organizations. And these are not just people who determine the color of a print button or, you know, uh, like even the flow of wizards. But they're focused on what is the job that a user wants to do? What's the job to be done? Uh, who are the users and what are their concerns? How are they going to go about solving this problem? What's the general sort of process and workflow that they're going to go through? And how do we best represent that in software? How do we make using their software uh, as easy as possible uh, going on? And then you have the product managers, which are distinct from project managers. And product managers are primarily focused on, I mean, the tactical thing they do is release to release. Every week they're prioritizing what you work on. But how they figure out how to prioritize that is they think about the sort of the business side of things, if you will, and how you're progressing solving users' problem and therefore what you should work on next. So they're very much so sort of like they, they hold on to the rudder guiding what, what, uh, what the software is doing week to week. Uh, as, as far as serving the business it's doing. Again, while it's profit or nonprofit is up to the organization. And then they're also the primary people who interface with uh, folks outside of the team. You know, you can kind of think of them as the, the miniature general, mini general manager or CEO to the team. And eventually all these, these roles kind of gel with each other. I mean, designers still design and engineers still engineers and product managers still uh, prioritize and sort of order out what you do, but they tend to, to share the knowledge and be on equal footing as time goes on. Now, what goes on in these organizations? Well, typically in these product teams, uh, 
they follow the a highly evolved uh, version of uh, of agile software development called extreme programming. And at Pivotal, uh, we've been working on that for about a quarter of a century and figuring out how to apply it in enterprise settings and evolving it along. And this focuses on test-driven development, writing tests before you do code so that it's immediately testable and it kind of guides what the coding is like. They follow these short iterations of weekly iterations. They have a, a continuous integration and continuous delivery build pipeline to automate builds and tests. Uh, but they also follow all sorts of other agile uh, techniques uh, that it turns out most people don't follow if you actually uh, study them. You see this in Gartner surveys a lot. But there's another practice that they do that's worth highlighting, and that is they pair amongst the roles. So developers pair programmer, product managers uh, tend to pair product manage, I guess, and designers pair product manage. And each day, you get together with a pair. I'll use developers for this. In the morning, you might pair with a developer and you have one machine that you're working on. You might have two screens, but it's one unit of code that you're working on. And one person might start writing tests and the other person writes code, right? So you write a test and then you, know, you run the test, it breaks because the code isn't doing what it needs. So you write the new code until the test passes. And you're, you're also, because you're working with a pair, you might be programming together, sharing knowledge, solving problems together. And you're also building up a rapport and a relationship with a coworker, which you'll see when we come to scaling things becomes incredibly important. And then maybe after lunch, you swap pairs out and you work on a different pair of the system. So you're spreading and you're, they, these people, your people across the entire system, they're learning how the whole system works, they're educating each other, and they're also getting to the point where I guess they're not goofing off as much, like they're extremely productive. So you see this from Allstate where they went, they, they figured, they baselined that the developers spent about 20% of their time, you know, every day, every week developing. And once they adopted this product team approach and also the pairing approach and the other practices, they became incredibly more productive because they were so much more disciplined in their overall approach that they were coding 90% of the time. So that kind of productivity improvement is amazing and gets to a lot of the benefits that people see when they're shifting to this product or in the way of doing things. So next, let's look at what platform engineers do. This team that is supporting the product team's ability to focus on and completely own the products that they're delivering and do this kind of weekly deploy of the software over and over again as they improve the process. So uh, what this team does, I think one way of summarizing it is they focus a lot on removing toil from the process of just getting software out of the day. So what does toil need? Well, this is a phrase taken from the Google SRE world. And it's, it's a fun, cutesy way of saying they automate a lot of manual processes. And they automate things that otherwise would take a very long time to do in a manual way. And I'll give you one example of that. And this is kind of learned from the lean uh, manufacturing and the lean software approach where basically you create a value stream map. That is all the activities end to end it takes to get software out the door. So think about one line of code. What would it take from coming up with one line of code, let's say to choose my favorite example, changing the color of a print button, to have, I want that button to be uh, purple. And then, so I say that idea and how long is it following all the process and activities and meeting schedules and everything that you need to do to actually have that show up in, in production for a user to you click on the purple print button. I try to say that really fast. Um, so you make this value stream map that charts all of that out. And you systematically, when you want to remove toil, you go through there and you, you remove things that have no value to the end user. So here's one example from uh, Daimler, where, and this is for an application that focuses on um, people looking to buy cars and, and uh, you know, kind of, doing research online and booking appointments and things. And one of the things highlighted in orange that they found is it was taking about a third of the time, if I'm doing my sort of visual analysis correctly, to basically requ requisition, provision, configure, and deploy the hardware associated with it. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't walk into a car dealership and say, first of all, one of the main reasons I'm here is because you spend so much time provisioning and configuring your hardware. That is incredibly valuable to me. A high differentiator is a connoisseur of buying cars like I don't really ever say that right it's completely it's complete waste that time spent is waste to to the actual customer so you identify that as a wasteful activity and you think about toil reduction is how can we reduce that how can we eliminate any time spent doing that now 
the way that they saw this over at Daimler was they put Pivotal Cloud Foundry in, pro, in place and put a platform uh, engineering team in place to stand it up and run it, right? You can see all sorts of other things that were done. A lot of the, the tweaks that it comes from a product team and being on that weekly cycle and having them own the whole product and removing a lot of the inefficiencies of a siloed approach as well. But they were able to reduce down their cycle uh, from 30 days to about two to three days by doing all sorts of tweaking like this. Now, your platform engineering team uh, they not only stand up and run Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but they treat the platform as a product and the product teams as the customers. And they're continually uh, making their own assessments about what's best for them and how to uh, configure things and improve things. And they might customize services and middleware that they have from databases to queues to monitoring all sorts of things like that. And they end up uh, really, again, running the platform as a product and enabling a lot of the efficiencies that the, 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 um, the product teams have. Now, there's so much toil reduction and automation that they have uh, that there's an ins insane amount of efficiency that each operations person, each platform engineer has. Each engineer can actually do a tremendous amount more work. So, for example, you see some sample numbers here from T-Mobile USA. They're supporting about 300 developers and 11,000 containers with just eight platform engineers. Now, again, if you remember, product teams are basically four to 12 people. That's a lot of applications across those three developers. And you can see after six months, similar uh, stats and efficiencies from Dick Sporting Goods down there. Um, so overall, uh, these platform engineer people are really helping out and enabling all of that efficiency and also the runtime stability and production that's needed to move that fast and become a more product-centric organization. So two of the technologies they put in place, just to give you an overview of that, one of the primary things they have in the platform, if you will, uh, is a build pipeline. Now, a build pipeline is incredibly important, not only for the sort of uh, continuous integration stuff we got from uh, you know, Jenkins, basically, and now we get from other CI tools, but automatically building and running your unit tests and packaging things for sure, like on demand when you check something in. But what becomes even more important is automating all your, inc your, incre your incredible, it is incredible, but your complete value stream to checking in that line of code and having it build, test, do all of your smoke tests, set up a new environment to test it in, deploy a, a production-like environment for staging, and all the way to actually deploying it to production and doing all the updates if you want to do that in an automated way. And this includes doing all of your automated audit and compliance checks, going through your security checks, generating all of the compliance things that you would need and going through all the different security checks and logging all of that in a highly automated fashion. Now, most people, they like to have one manual step at the end where someone like a product manager or someone else pushes a button to deploy to production. I don't know, they don't trust robots or something. But you should expect that this cycle, you're able to completely go through this cycle, uh, you know, for one release in, in uh, five days, but also kind of going through this cycle with a very small amount of code. For example, uh, someone like Greater American Insurance Company, GIC, I think they can do this in about 10 or 15 minutes for a small amount of code, just like full cycle deploying. So the platform engineering team focuses on the standardized central way of doing this most efficiently and doing it quickly. And this becomes a core asset that that team has. Now also what they do is they build out that platform, the runtime in, uh, environment and also the development environment that contains the multitude of everything that you need. Not only running the software and the libraries, the frameworks, and then the monitoring things, but as you can imagine, orchestrating the containers, automating the management of the networking, handling all these security things, the search engine that you, you use, like on and on and on, like you have all sorts of things in here, right? Now, some organizations, and sadly many of them, uh, decide to build this on their own, kind of from, from uh, scratch and also from open source things. And what they find, and we have a study underneath here that goes over this, is it takes them about a couple of years, and I think about $7 million a year in staffing, if you do some simple numbers. And then they have this for the rest of their life to worry about. They've got this product they need to maintain. And then if they're not treating it like a product, right, there'll be incoming requests to like it might start off with Java and then people want .NET to work on it. And then they might want to have like Elastic in there or Splunk support or something like all sorts of things like that. And you're going to have to keep up this initial spend and constantly be updating and product managing and treating this as a product that you owe which is often not what an organization wants to get involved in, right? They don't want to be in the business of creating a platform, a platform as a service, as a core thing that they do. Instead, they want to focus on their actual banking applications, uh, for example. So we have something that can help out with that if you don't want to be in the business of making platforms, and that is Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Ta-da! Now, 
uh, I'll, I'll sort of joking aside, just to give you a very quick idea of what it is. It essentially bundles together a completely self-service uh, where you don't, you don't need to worry about managing containers and infrastructures component called the Pivotal Application Service. And that makes it very easy and self-service for developers to package up, deploy, configure, and even add in all the various middleware and things that they need. There's also a Kubernetes distribution in the middle called Pivotal Container Service. Uh, that we release on a regular cadence, uh, keeping keeping up with the whatever Kubernetes version is out there. And coming soon, we have a serverless uh, section, a part called Pivotal Functional Service, or Pivotal Function Service, I should say. And then also the marketplace over there. We came up with this in the 90s, so we call it a marketplace. And essentially what that has is all of the middleware and databases and queues and things like that, again, that you can add in in a self-service way of doing it. Now, it runs on top of whatever public or private infrastructure you have from uh, public clouds and uh, private clouds. You know, you see all the great clouds down there. But also, you can run it on-premise on OpenStack, on uh, a VMware stack. And we also have a certified uh, stack with our Dell Technologies friends that runs on VxRail with, uh, you know, VMware and everything on there. So it's really easy to get up and running with it. There's all sorts of, of ways to get it stacked up. So as the professor down there says, please. Try my product. So let's look at the last component, leadership, and why it's so important if you want to scale up and really change the entire organization over to be this kind of product-driven way of doing things and improve software so, so your business can improve as well. So as you can imagine, at a large organization, whether it's a, a T-Mobile or a place like a JP Morgan Chase with 19,000 developers or so, Changing over a few teams to be product-oriented is relatively easy, right? You almost can rely on them doing it themselves if they're interested in improving. But changing over those 19,000 developers, thousands of different uh, applications and services that you're doing is not going to happen in a groundswell sort of way, right? So you do need a tremendous amount of involvement from executives, upper-level management, enterprise architects, who themselves will be taking a product-driven approach to the organization and programming it, right? They need to do as much work as we're asking the product and the operations people to do. So let's look at why and how that they're so important to uh, changing things over. Again, something that I see happen in all successful organizations if they scale up change is oftentimes all the way up to the CEO, and if you're lucky board level, they get involved in the change as well and supporting and thinking about and helping with that, uh, leading that change management. So first of all, I think what's important is the usual things, right? Setting a good vision, setting a good strategy, defining why you're going through this. I mean, if you're, if you're interested in this topic, you probably already know that you have to change the way you do business to not only be competitive, but grow your business and expand, right? Uh, but not everyone is sort of on board with that. They don't really care because they don't need to. So setting in place a good vision and a strategy of how to execute that vision is, is very key. And, and, it's easy to go over this too much, uh, but I think this is such a great example and it proves the point that it is incumbent on leadership to really come up with the motivation for why we're going to start suffering through all this change. And I think this example from DBS Bank is great, right? So their vision uh, is to live more and bank less for their customers. I'm sure D you would like DBS to bank a lot, but they want their customers to not spend all their time kind of hanging out with their bank and worrying about it in their banking software. Kind of like the IRS example, if you remember, right? You want to get in and out to pay your taxes. And similarly, like I want to get on with living my life and just have banking get out of the way. I don't want it to be a hassle. So they are going from that vision. They're putting a product approach in place. And they're going all the way down to the product teams and they focus on that vision and it really drives not only what the product teams are doing, what individuals are doing, but it encourages the business side, the executives to have a singular focus of what they're doing. And so you need to come up with a similar sort of crisp vision that's very executable, if you will, and then a strategy that maps how to execute it. Now, I would suggest that the strategy is a lot of what we're going over here, right? Becoming a product organization, switching the organization over to be set up to be product oriented, having a platform team underneath there, having a product team doing it, having the EAs continually guide how things are going. So that's probably a large part of the strategy that you can start going with as you customize it. Now, what does it mean for a uh, leader to put in place uh, a culture of innovation? Because that's really what we're talking about here at that kind of upper level above the, uh, the, the technology stack is we're changing over to an innovative culture. Well, first let's think about what an innovative culture is, right? And when you're innovating, you're constantly learning and exploring and doing new ways of doing things. That is, you're a risk taker who's always failing. Now, 
we often think that we celebrate risk takers, but often I think what we're celebrating are people who are successful. It's very rare that we're like, oh, that person's a risk taker. Look at all the failure they've had. And we don't talk about the successes, right? It's all about success. But generally having a risk taking culture and, and celebrating them is realizing the tremendous amount of failure that goes into being successful and learning something, right? Just like that IRS example where they failed many times before they came to that simple solution. But they had this disciplined uh, approach uh, in place that allowed them to become successful instead of a total failure, right? So you want to have a culture that is innovative, takes risks, and is very much so focused on people. We want to solve people's problems, right? So that is a very product-oriented way of doing things. Now, at the team level, what this often means, what you kind of give the team, to put it in a paternal kind of way, I guess, is you give the team autonomy, right? So they work on that one product, that one thing, and they, they have very few dependencies. They are in charge of all of the things that they need. They have the platform supporting a self-service way of doing things. They don't have to wait and file tickets and wait in meetings. Um, but you also trust them to actually make their own decisions and you don't micromanage them, right? Again, if you want them to be innovative, they need to take risks, they need to be autonomous, and therefore you're gonna have to trust them. Now, the third attribute, uh, the, and all of these come from uh, ongoing DevOps reports if you wanna dig into them more. There's a very great overview of that and kind of on multi-year proof points that these are three core assets for, for putting a, a DevOps or an innovative culture in place. But you give them a voice, right? You allow them to discover new and better ways of doing things, kind of like the IRS people discovered a new and better way of doing things. Uh, and they can actually, t they have the authority, the autonomy to take action on that and uh, put it into place. Now, a tremendous amount of what you're doing when you're leading this change is you're building up trust, one, that it's okay to change and trust that it's okay to be risk takers and essentially trust in yourself that you mean what you say. So it's good to think about how you put things like blameless postmortems in place to sort of prove that it's okay to fail, how you reward and compensate people, how you actually set up the organizations to be product centric with the platform engineering team in place, how you actually give them a platform like Pivotal Cloud Foundry that allows them to be independent and not have to wait on other people and deploy things on their own. And then you might want to, you know, you need to put a feedback process in place, whether that's doing, uh, you know, net promoter score surveys for, or, you know, observing, observing kind of like the churn that you have is indicative of people being happy or not happy, all sorts of things like that. And you can use all the fancy like uh, goaling stuff, move from KPIs to OKRs. But the point is you as a, a change leader are really going to have to spend a lot of time coming up with a theory of how to change things, testing it out if it works keep doing it. If it doesn't work, come up with another way of doing it. And if you think about it, you will be failing a lot too. So that's a good way to start celebrating failures is to have sort of like in your uh, monthly failure fest where people go over failures that they've had of a way of showing that it's okay to fail and how to learn from it and learning uh, role modeling from that process. You could start doing that by talking about ways you wanted to change the organization over and how it failed. And you can really build up trust that it's okay to become an innovation uh, driven culture that's very product centric. So how do you get started? Well, you might think that you want to take the highest, most important thing that, and you'll get a huge boost from improving it and uh, all sorts of return on investments and things like that. And with very rare exception, that's okay. But generally, if you choose the most important, biggest thing, it's going to turn out very bad for you. So instead, what you want to do is choose a series of small projects that are real projects. And as you're learning, as you're failing, right? As you're learning what the new organization looks like, learning the technology, the practices, you slowly ramp up more and more of these small projects. And you can kind of see that indicated by this line from the Home Depot as they were ramping up their projects. And so as an example, some of the initial projects they picked were the software that drove the, uh, the paint desk, you know, the custom mixing paint desk where you go in and buy some initial paint and then have the, the paint color customize their tool rental business. Businesses that were real, but that, uh, could be improved and were much better. And so as they, they had fits and starts and learned how to do things, they improved the business. And once they became really good at this new method, this product-driven approach, they substantially improved the success of those businesses, built up trust in the organization, trained the organization, and were able to do more and more projects successfully. So think about how you would figure out what this small series of projects is and manage, slowly ramp that project up over a couple of years, you know, after a year. So like the U.S. Air Force, uh, they, over about a course of a year, they'll, uh, maybe a year and a half, they'll go from one initial project to about 18 different projects in production. Uh, and so you can think of that as another good guide to how, how you set the cycle and your expectations. 
So another thing I mentioned briefly, uh, another example from DBS is this act of pairing people is another great way to scale and spread culture, right? So on the team, when you pair people up on your development team, it spreads knowledge and wins over trust and they kind of all start teaching each other. Well, over time, you take keep, you know, uh, sort of people who are good at teaching and good people people person, people, persons, if you will, uh, from that team and you seed them in brand new teams, right? So you have experts who are also trusted because they're part of you. They're part of the organization. You might bring in someone like Pivotal Labs to help seed that initially, but ultimately your fellow employees are going to be a lot more trustworthy. And so you cycle them through teams and you can imagine kind of the exponential spread as you seed more and more people that you're training yourself. And it's a very scalable way of parent of of spreading this change and teaching by pairing things up, which you can see uh, they're putting in practice at DBS as a way of, of becoming more of a product-oriented culture. So another thing that's key, uh, and I used to be a little wishy-washy about this, but nowadays I think it's actually very important to, about on a quarterly basis, uh, I would say a quarterly basis, just start with that. Think about having internal summits, or I I'm putting it in wishy-washy basis. On a quarterly basis, have an internal summit or a conference. And it should probably be a day. If you can do two days or a day and a half, better for you. But you will want to go region by region, depending on how large you are, and have as many people in the room for that region as possible. And start presenting to yourself. Have these successful product teams like Home Depot's Paint Desk or Tools Rental or the Air Force applications or the IRS application or the ones from Air France KLM. Have them present what that, that product was, how they went through fits and starts and they struggled and they learned a new process and the lessons learned from it. This is a good place to have your blameless postmortems where you celebrate failure and show that it's actually okay to do that and you build up trust. And then you're also educating people about how to use the new technology. So oftentimes we at Pivotal uh, get brought in to sort of seed that content, right? Especially to go over how to use Spring and Pivotal Cloud Foundry and I come in and talk about like organizational things uh, as, as you're seeing here, but most of it, uh, you know, maybe even 90% of it, if not a hundred percent of it should be you talking to yourself. And as you do this on a quarterly basis and you can do have remote viewers and things like that, you will build up trust and education in the rest of the organization. And over the course of a year or two, it'll help you really ramp up scaling that change to the rest of the organization and spreading it beyond those initial teams. Now, all of that sounds great, right? But there's always many objections uh, to putting these changes uh, in place. And so I wanna just go over briefly some of the common objections and ways of trying to get around them. As with any objection, sometimes it just doesn't work. And I should mention at this point that if you find all of this interesting and intuitively good and your organization just, it seems impossible they're gonna change despite what you tried to do, Pivotal's always hiring and they have a great referral bonus. So you can email me, C-O-T-E at Pivotal.io. You can reach me in Twitter. I'm at Cote, C-O-T-E. We get a great referral bonus. If you stay for 90 days, I get that referral bonus. You can do whatever you want on day 91, but stay for 90 days. It's a great place to work. We follow all these practices. You get free breakfast. It's really nice. You get to work with me, other people. But if you want to try to change your organization over, here are some ways that uh, people are going about getting over objections. So first of all, sadly, I encounter this a lot in Europe. I'm not sure about Asia or other places. And in, 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 uh, in the U.S. and in North America, it doesn't happen so much. But I often hear that there are, let's say, vice presidents or upper-level management who are very interested in changing. They feel the urgency and they want to change over, but they don't have support from their bosses, from higher-level executives, who just seem kind of complacent. I mean, I guess they don't want to rock the boat, boat and they're just waiting for retirement to come in or something. Um, and again, this doesn't happen all the time at all, but it comes up sometimes and is a blocker for improving how your organization does things. So what I recommend to people is instead of focusing on growth and improving, uh, and I know it's sad, someone wouldn't want to do that, but focus on cost savings. So I have so far talked about being able to grow better, being more efficient. And another way of looking at that is saving costs, right? If your developers are much more efficient, you'll be able to save costs. If your operations people are more efficient, because you can move faster and you don't have to do things like managing an operating system, right? So the platform means that you no longer spend all that time and money managing an operating system. It automates all of that for you across all the applications that you use. But there's a lot of savings to be had in that. And so I would expect that even if you have the most complacent, just kind of sitting on their thumbs, upper level management, who's not helping you, they would probably love to save money. Everyone likes saving money. So think about using these averages that are uh, 
platform architecture teams have found. Use averages like these and others to show how you could potentially be saving money and improving the business. Only on those, those merits if you switch over to this new way of doing things, right? Think of going from coding 20% of the time to 90% of the time and how much of an improvement that would look in your finances and uh, your spreadsheets that these people maybe care more about. So next, it's often hard to really change the way an organization functions, right? Like you're trying to change the organization from within and change the state of it and transform it. And pretty frequently, organizations find that that's impossible and way too much effort for the payoff. So what they do is they set up a completely new organization, not necessarily a legal entity, but they set up a different organization very frequently in a different physical location, maybe just a floor level, but they have their own facilities. They take a volunteer workforce so you don't get a bunch of grumpy stick in the muds. Uh, and they start working on that small series of projects. Now, this obviously requires a certain amount of high level executive uh, function uh, sponsorship. Again, why executives are so important. But once you get this rolling, you're able to build up trust, you bring more and more people over, you show that the process works, and you're leaving behind all the grumpy detractor people. And oftentimes, as you see with Allstate here, you come up with a name for it, and eventually, you know, you've got your existing organization, and you slowly move people over to the new organization, and things maybe that should be managed in the old way are left over there, and, and the new way uh, is over here prospering and and thriving on its own. Again, not to the detriment of over here. It's just they get to decide how to manage things if they don't want to do things uh, in a new way. So that comes up over and over again. This idea, as I like to think of it, is uh, it's all organizations are immutable. Once you set them up and they're, they become successful, they can't be changed. So you have to create a brand new organization. So another common thing that comes up is often when you start these initial product teams, you take the best and the brightest, the experts, and you assemble them on the team. And you might even think of them as ninjas or rock stars. Now, I, I remember in the 80s, rock stars were annoying because they would wreck hotel rooms and their life. But what you want to do in these initial teams is have not only experts, but just regular people. It's kind of a judgmental way, but normal people who you'll find are just as good as experts once you set up the right environment for them and have the, kind of, the right kind of product-centric workflow. And you want to do this because they will be inspiring for other people who individuals who think they can't do things in this new way because they're a crusty old developer, but also the management and the rest of your organization who will immediately, when you're successful with your rock star team, they'll say, well, sure, you took all of my best people and put them on a team. And if I had all the best people, I would be equally successful. Now, one, it's kind of depressing that they think their current people are not their best people and that they're not capable. It sounds like a management problem. But there's a way of getting over that by not having all rock stars in the team. And you see this play out over and over again as well. So as the last one, uh, a lot of time compliance and audit and things like that are in the way. Um, and I think what you'll find is that if you think back to that build pipeline and all the automation that's in uh, the platform that you have, you'll have to talk with your auditors and compliance people a lot, but you'll be able to automate a tremendous amount of that. And in fact, the, the jobs, the lives, and the goals, uh, what your auditors and compliance people are doing will be so much better than before, right? There's, there's a great quote uh, from Mark at uh, HCSC, uh, American Health Insurance Company, where you, know, you can put whatever you want into a Word document, that Word document being the typical way that compliance works. And so instead, as the US Air Force found, what you can do is you work with the auditors and you get them to trust the platform, the discipline that you follow, and when you deploy that one line of code, that release, so to speak, all you have to verify is this chunk up at the top. You don't have to verify everything down to the dirt. So you can reduce a huge amount of the controls you have to go through. And you, as the Air Force found here, using them as an example, you speed up your, your compliance time, the time you're waiting just going through audit from 10 months to less than a week, which is amazing for the Air Force. And definitely if they can do it in a large military, uh, you can sort out any sort of compliance hurdles that you have. So all sorts of organizations are uh, being very successful changing over, right? And one, I go over to this to kind of boast, but I think what's really important is to understand if you're in a large organization that's not like a tech company and you're all worried about not being able to succeed, it's actually possible. You can look at your peers who are very successful at it. And not only do they have success at improving the performance of their IT, you know, shipping more frequently, doing all this kind of stuff, but they're having very real business effects. So they're going all the way back to improving the way the business is running. And I'll close out with an example that pulls this all together and is an example of that outcome, right? Like things like DevOps and containers and Kubernetes and cloud, like it's all fun and dandy. But if you don't have an actual outcome, if that's not what you're focused on, then who cares, right? Like it's not that big of a deal. So as an example, 
this is uh, from Liberty Mutual, a large uh, insurance company, and they wanted to enter a new business that they had never been in before, the Australian motorcycle business. So the business wanted to grow and, and be global and grow revenue and you know have, have a very fast time to market there, right? So because they were a product-centric organization, and this is, it was necessary, not sufficient. They also needed to you know, have business development and regulatory stuff, I'm sure, and pricing, all sorts of things. But IT became a core enabler of the success they had there. So within six months, they were able to enter that market. A very fast time to market, if you think about that. Like, could you enter a market in six months? So they were able to enter that market and start transacting in six months. And because they were able to release the software that their agents were using and study that software on a weekly basis, they were constantly improving it. And they were making the process of finding and signing up for insurance more efficient and constantly uh, making it more productive and making it easier, not only for the agents, but for the people signing up for the insurance and also raising the quality of their qualifications and their checks, as you can imagine, right? So this meant that they were able uh, in their business to double the average close rate, the average sales rate. So on average, it's a 20% close rate, right? You close 20% of the business, but they got it all the way up to doubling that to 40%, right? So they had an extremely fast time to market. They're still constantly able to, uh, to improve the software, right? They're always making it better. And they doubled the average uh, close rate that they had. And whatever problems you may have or doubts or anything like that, business cases you need to make, I hesitate to say guarantee, but whatever. I guarantee you if you double your revenue, if you double your sales rate, all those problems will magically disappear and everyone will be happy to help you out. So that's a brief overview of how large organizations are improving the way they do software and kind of my idea of what digital transformation is. There's a lot more detail in a older version of a book that I have. Uh, you can find it uh, for free down there as a PDF. Uh, at that URL. Uh, it's about 59 pages or 49 or something. And it details these things out a lot more and goes over some more theory and tactics. There's a new version that's, it's not a complete read write, but it's a very thorough revisiting and rewriting that hopefully will be out at the end of the year, 2018. Uh, you can also find excerpts from that and a draft uh, if you want to read the complete draft of it there at that URL and some other presentations that go over what culture changes, enterprise architecture, and also a much longer sort of lecture, 120 minute uh, version of, of this talk if you want to delve into more details and more use cases. So with that, thanks. And uh, tell me if this is useful for you. I'm always interested in getting feedback and talking with more people. Don't, don't call me on the phone. I don't answer that. But you can reach me an email and uh, Twitter down below there. Bye-bye.